A um, little bit of a, of a place setting for this story. Um, the, the, the thing that makes it interesting is that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, number one, but not just a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin which means that he was part of the kind of the ruling council. So this, this was a guy who was not just in the system. This guy was in the inner, 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 inner circle uh, of the system. And, um, and in spite of that, he chooses to go and meet with Jesus. So let us hear the story of that visit. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus said, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God for this word to us. Now, we all know about darkness and light. We live darkness and light. We change our clocks to deal with darkness and light. We talk about darkness and light. We use the concept of darkness and light to talk about deep things, philosophical things, spiritual things. Plato, the philosopher, once said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. But the real tragedy of life is when adults are afraid of the light. Interesting comment. Mary Oliver, who was an amazing poet, wrote, Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this, too, was a gift. Often we think of darkness which, as that which is foreboding, dangerous, evil, and we think of light, often, as that which is positive and hopeful and good. The Bible uses light and dark that way, correct? There's hundreds, hundreds of verses that talk about darkness and light that way. Ephesians, for example. You, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light. Walk then as children of light. Also from Ephesians, all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. Colossians, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transformed, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. But it is not as simple as darkness equals evil, light equals good. 
Think about it. Most of us think of darkness as a place where danger lurks, but some of us might think of darkness as a place where we can hide. Actually, think of it as a place of safety. Most of us think of light as joyful and safe, but some might think of light as something that reveals, and they might not want that kind of revelation. So it's a mixed bag. Light and dark have a relationship, but it's kind of complex. And many very wise people have suggested that darkness has its own lessons to teach, that it's not all bad. And many others have pointed out that the light gains even more power in the context of darkness. So light and dark interact. Recently, Joan Chittister, who is an activist nun, she's one of the ones in the bus that goes around talking to people, wrote the, these words. There is a light in us that only darkness itself can illuminate. It is the glowing calm that comes over us when we finally surrender to the ultimate truth of creation, that there is a God and we are not it. So it is no accident, I think, that Nicodemus, in this story, comes to Jesus in the darkness. This is a point that John is very careful to make. He came at night. Now I suspect Nicodemus had his reasons for sneaking in and coming to Jesus in the dark, right? Perhaps he didn't want others to see him. As a member of the Sanhedrin, as the member of the ruling council, Going to see this renegade teacher was a risky thing. Could lead to all kinds of problems for him. So perhaps he didn't want other people to see him. But it also might be that he just felt a little bit safer in the dark. Not wanting to be fully seen by the penetrating and troubling gaze of this man from Galilee. We don't really know why Nicodemus decided to come to Jesus in the night, but we have to understand that it was night and it was dark. We can't think of a modern house ablaze with lights powered by electricity, and we can't think of a street illuminated by vapor lights. In Israel at this time of history, night was night. <laughs> it was dark. And it was in the dark that Jesus and Nicodemus met. And it's interesting that Nicodemus decides to start the conversation with a little bit of flattery. Rabbi, we know. We all know. That you are a teacher who has come from God because no one could do the signs that you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus answers that in a very curious way. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Now, where did that come from, right? It doesn't connect with that flattery at all. It's an odd response. You must be born again. Well, that's what Nicodemus heard anyway. He takes the comment very literally, and he chooses to interpret one of the words that Jesus uses as again. And so he reacts by saying, essentially, that's crazy. How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? We often end up in trouble when we take things too literally, don't we? To which Jesus responds with yet another response that can seem disconnected from what Nicodemus is saying. Truly I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. So the problem here is the Greek word anothen. We really are not sure what the original word was that Jesus used because he may or may not have spoken in Greek. He may have, but he may have spoken in Aramaic. 
But the word anothen in Greek is a tricky word. It means, as many Greek words do, more than one thing. It means again, but it also means above. And so all the early translations of the Bible translated the word again. You must be born again. That's what's in the King James. That's how I will bet almost everybody in this room learned it. Right? You must be born again. And that's how Nicodemus took it. How can you be born again? But it's clear if you follow the flow of Jesus' teaching that he meant above. Which is how most modern translations you translate the word and put it into their translation. So, New Revised Standard Version, you must be born from above. Which, to put it another way, is you have to let God reboot you. You have to let the Spirit come down and transform you and change you and move you and transform you spiritually. No one can see the kingdom without being born of the water and the Spirit. So we've got references here to baptism, right? We've got references here to the Holy Spirit. No one can see the kingdom without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. And do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. In other words, you've got to let yourself, let it go, and let God take you wherever God's going to take you. That's what you've got to do. That's the gospel, right? You must be awake to the Spirit, to sacred presence, and you've got to let that Spirit take you where it wants to take you. Even if you don't understand. Even if you don't have it all figured out. You just go with the Spirit. And that's how you access the new life that God offers. So, Nicodemus hears this. And there in the safety of the darkness, he thinks. And he processes. And he resists. I still don't get it. <laughs> How can this be? <laughs> and Jesus gets a little impatient, I think. How can you be a leader and a teacher of the people and not get this? And then the lesson continues. And Jesus starts talking about darkness and light. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, we all know this one, right? So that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that all the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Those who do not believe are condemned because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than light. And all he's really saying is, if you don't let the light in, you don't get transformed. Now that's an invitation, right? It's an invitation to let the light in. It's an invitation to come out of the darkness. It's also a little bit of a challenge and a warning, right? You can't stay in hiding. You don't get to stay in the dark. You have to let the Spirit in, and you have to be born to the light. Now, as I think about this passage, and I think about those words, I, can't, I always keep thinking, it always brings me back to Leonard Cohen's lyrics from the, from the song Anthem, right? Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Nicodemus sat in the darkness. I think he probably was a little bit afraid. He was certainly confused. He was definitely troubled. And because of all of that, he was vulnerable. There was a crack. 
in the veneer of Nicodemus. And Jesus said to him as he sat there, let the light in. You don't have to be perfect. Just be open. Let the light in. And I think as he sat there in that dark and that crack opened, the light got in. In fact, we know it got in. Because guess what happens down the road? Nicodemus is one of the two people who takes Jesus' body down from the cross and prepares it for burial and takes it to the tomb. This guy who was so afraid of what other people might think that he hid in the darkness when he, first, when he made his first approach to Jesus is out there in plain sight at the death of Jesus, preparing Jesus' body for funeral and proclaiming his alliance with Jesus. We should not begrudge Nicodemus for his time in the darkness. Because I think it was his time in the darkness that ultimately enabled him. That time when he sat there in the darkness, really troubled and struggling. I think it was that time that ultimately enabled him to step forth fully into the light. A man born from above. And I think that should give us hope, right? Because we have moments when we're sitting in the darkness. A little bit troubled, a little bit frustrated, a little bit confused. There are times when we sit in the dark and nothing we normally rely on seems to be working. There are times when we sit in the dark and we can't see the next step. There's times when we're frightened, times when we are confused, there's times when we hide. But that time in the darkness can have its blessing. Because sometimes in the darkness, we are able to let go. Sometimes we are forced to let go. Let go of our wisdom, let go of our perceived expertise, let go of our tight control of our lives, let go of our power, let go of our narrow concepts of God, let go of our worldly status. Sometimes as we sit in the dark, we crack. And the light gets in. And the Spirit comes and it blows us where it will. And we learn to be led. And we learn to be comforted. And we learn to be loved. And in that place, we are born from above. Filled with the Spirit. Empowered for a new life. Barbara Brown Taylor, who I respect greatly, once wrote a phrase that for me is a word of profound hope and I think really wraps up this story and, and many stories from the Bible in a beautiful, a beautiful way. She writes, New life starts in the dark. New life starts in the dark. Whether it is a seed in the ground, a baby in the womb, or Jesus in the tomb, it starts in the dark. Bottom line, the darkness, as scary as it is, is often where we are finally able to see the light and be born from above. Not just once, but again and again and again. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for Nicodemus, for the fact that he took that step to meet with Jesus, even though he kind of hid a little bit while he did it. But we thank you that while in that dark place, hiding a little bit, seeking safety a little bit, the light shone and managed to make its way into his soul. We thank you that the Spirit was able to blow through him and blow him toward faith and toward that moment when he was there for Jesus and continued to be a part of the Jesus movement. Help us to follow the path that Nicodemus took. 
whether we stride forth boldly or whether we come to Jesus in the dark. May the light get in and may we be born from above. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.